Hello, welcome to the LaRouche Pack Weekly Report for September the 26th, 2012. I'm John Hofel, and joining me in the studio today are Leona Fan Chang and Ben Denniston of The Basement and Lyndon LaRouche. Good morning, Lynn. Well, it's going to be an interesting week, what's left of it, uh, in the sense that we're, what we're taking a scientific subject today, which is of relevance and importance. But in the meantime, we have everything is shaking up and is about to be rattled fully with a general collapse promise for the world as a whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've just, that's on our mind, but science must proceed. Right. Maybe good, you know, the point is in this context to give the counterpoint for what the future needs to be, where we can go, what the alternative is. And uh, so, I mean, on that note, you know, and continuing the discussions we've been having here for the last weeks, you know, we had a very significant opportunity to participate in an uh, international conference in Ukraine a few weeks back. Um, the conference was on the subject of international collaboration on defense, on defending the entire planet. And myself and Jason Ross were lucky enough to be able to go to participate, to present, uh, actually the only representatives from the United States to present at this conference, which featured a lot of participation from Russia, from Ukraine, from a few other nations. And we were able to go and present uh, the perspective from the United States and deliver a very clear message that there is a fight inside the United States to take up these issues of the defense of mankind and get the United States away from its current orientation under Obama, under this imperial policy, and actually engage in collaboration on the highest levels of the, of the most powerful nations of the U.S., Russia, China, et cetera, collaborating in these aims to actually defend mankind. And so the conference itself was very significant. I want to kind of give a picture of some of what was discussed because it gives you a clear sense of uh, where mankind can go. And it ties into a lot of what we've been discussing uh, what you've been emphasizing, Lynn, in terms of where mankind needs to go in terms of the development of mind, of the human mind, where, how the human species needs to change and develop as a species in order to ensure that we can achieve the goals and aims that are required to advance, advance out of the current crisis and, and, and advance to a new state of mankind. So the conference itself, um, you know, it's significant because it comes also in the context of the strategic defense of Earth proposal that Russia has proposed, which they put on the table very clearly an explicit uh, alternative as an explicit alternative to the war policy. They were citing very specifically the uh, U.S. NATO placement of missile systems in Europe. They're citing the building tensions between the United States and Russia, and they said, "Why don't we go in this alternative route? Why don't we go towards the collaboration between the United States and Russia?" in developing both missile defense systems, but also systems to defend the entire planet against the threat of asteroids and comets, which, as we discussed, is a very real threat that needs to be dealt with. So this has been it's proposed in the fall of 2011. Um, so this current conference that we just attended uh, uh, in, under the name of Space and the Global Security of Humanity was in the context of Russia's putting out this offer to the United States. And this conference we attended in Ukraine focused on the work of, an, of a proposal of an organization that goes by the name of IGMOS, which stands for International Global Monitoring Aerospace System. So the proposal is to, you have a lot of nations in the world. We all face the same threats, right? Earthquakes don't, you know, examine what the, uh, bound, the borders of different countries are before they strike. You know, an asteroid doesn't say, you know, is this nation part of the uh, NATO bloc or not before it comes in and hits. You know, mankind as a whole, we face a certain reality that mankind as a whole faces. So, you know, it was kind of, that's the idea underlying this conference is why, why don't nations collaborate in sharing their defense capabilities, their observation capabilities to... Uh, create a system where nations can collaborate to ensure the highest level of defense possible. Because uh, the United States has certain satellite systems, certain observation systems. Russia has different ones. Other nations have other ones. So why not create a system where we can actually integrate in real time all the ground-based, air-based, and satellite-based observation systems of both the Earth and nearby space and even extending out to the sun 
to give mankind the greatest capability to defend himself from a whole array of threats. And, and the type of threats they include, you know, in, in what they include in the scope of this proposal is that we would collaborate in monitoring for uh, industrial accidents, um, but then also looking at things like anomalous solar activity. So monitoring the sun to see what the sun's doing and look for anomalous activity that could affect us here on Earth. Uh, monitoring for space debris. There's thousands of uh, pieces of junk floating around the planet that are constantly posing a threat to satellites and the space station and different things we have orbiting. So it's a serious concern. Um, monitoring for asteroids and comets getting early warning and defense capability against asteroids and comets. Uh, also monitoring for earthquakes, volcanoes, and tsunamis. And uh, even from the standpoint of developing forecasting capabilities to warn about these threats before they occur. Uh, and then also everything from fires to landslides, floods, dangerous weather systems. So you just take the broadest array of conditions that all nations have to deal with. And the idea is to get serious collaboration in integrating these different observation systems to be able to address these threats. And there's other proposals that have existed for somewhat similar programs. The United Nations has a similar proposal. Um, a couple of the agencies are putting out similar proposals for sharing satellite data and different things. But one thing that makes this one very unique, the IGMAS proposal, is this idea of forecasting. Mm -hmm. And this is something, you know, it's one thing to say a disaster happens and we should look and see how we can help respond. You know, that's responding after the fact. It's obviously important. A lot of nations don't have satellites, so they can't do that themselves. So they need help from nations that do have the capabilities to see that. But it's a whole other question to say, we want to forecast crises before they occur. And we want to know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and how to make sure that we can uh, 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 make sure it has the least damage possible. And I think the clearest example of that is this uh, example of earthquake forecasting, which we've done some, we've covered a fair amount, and uh, it's a very interesting topic. And this was one of the central points discussed at this conference. And um, it's worth noting that under this program, under the IGMAS program, in Russia, they've supported a uh, for the past year, since about May, I believe, they've supported a trial program to actually begin real-time uh, forecasting of earthquakes. And it's not perfect, it's not a perfect thing, but they've had some major breakthroughs and some major success demonstrating that we need to pursue this, and it is possible to develop systems to forecast and give early warnings of major seismic events. And so this system uh, that's been operating in the past year is... Uh, run by something called the Earth Research Monitoring Center. And they, they picked a region in uh, the Pacific Coast region of, uh, of Asia, so covering Japan, uh, Sakhalin Island, that whole region. And they picked a you know, relatively small region for the past uh, eight months or so, focused on uh, observing this region and trying to forecast any major seismic events, any major earthquakes that occurred in this region. And it's interesting just to give a sense, because they look at a whole broad range of parameters. And they, they made three forecasts, official forecasts in this period, and each one came reasonably within what they said. So they demonstrated that there is progress being made and there is uh, a capability to have real forecasting systems for earthquakes. But it's interesting, they have a certain uh, system they use. Where they look at a wide range of parameters. They look at the uh, rotation of the Earth for shifts and changes in how the Earth rotates. Uh, they look at gravitational anomalies. They look at uh, stresses in the Earth's crust. Uh, they also look at things like cloud cover. They monitor certain irregularities in the cloud cover. Um, they look at gas emissions, variations in gas being emitted from fault zones, from uh, 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 tectonic regions. Uh, they look at the Earth's magnetic field, and they also look at solar activity. They look at the activity of the sun. They look at the activity of uh, the, um, what we call the interplanetary magnetic field, the sun's magnetic field. Yeah. And so they have this array of parameters. They have a theory about how these things interact. And, it, it, and this is the basis of then a system they're developing to try and do this forecasting. 
And uh, I have one image here, just worth just kind of highlighting. It's fun. This is a one of their forecasts they officially issued for a for, for an earthquake in this region in this time period. Um, and all this is available on uh, our website in a report we just released that discusses this in more detail and gives a lot of the background. But it's just fun. This is a, a letter submitted from the center forecasting an earthquake, and they submitted this letter to the, um, uh, I believe, both the Russian Academy of Sciences and maybe also Russia's Emergency Management uh, Ministry, what I believe is their equivalent of FEMA or something similar to FEMA for Russia. So this is an example of a forecast they made. They submitted it, and uh, something very similar to what they warned would happen did happen uh, in the following days or weeks after. So uh, there's progress being made in this area. Uh, the conference was uh, you know, very insightful in showing what we can do uh, in these areas if we actually got serious collaboration uh, in actually pursuing these, these areas of investigation. I think it's worth highlighting that, you know, in the context of what we've been discussing on these shows, you know, they're monitoring a whole array of things that otherwise just to our simple biology would be invisible. They'd be completely invisible processes. You know, you're looking at gas emissions you wouldn't be able to detect just by looking at them. They're looking at fluctuations in the magnetic field which you wouldn't be able to detect just by your you know, normal biological senses. They're looking at the activity going on in space, which we need special instruments to detect. So they have, they're using a whole pretty impressive array of synthetic uh, uh, apparatuses that are monitoring all these different types of activity. They're monitoring what's going on in the atmosphere. They're monitoring what's going on on the sun, what's going on in space, what's going on with the Earth's magnetic field, what's going on with the gravitational effects of the Earth. And so they're taking all these, so if you really like, if you really think through and imagine what they're looking at, they're, they're building this complex layered structuring of space, which we can only access by developing these types of uh, uh, synthetic instrumentation. They give, they, give the, they give the human mind access to a completely new view of the universe that we wouldn't, that we wouldn't have just by operating by our normal biological senses. And so you get this idea of developing a, a illustrated picture of how structured and filled space is with an entire array of activity, with the sun interacting with the earth, the earth systems interacting with the atmosphere and the magnetic field and the, the lithosphere, the earth structure, and all these processes that are constantly going on. But it's only when mankind is moving away from his just reliance on basic sense perceptions and moving towards a reliance where the mind is becoming integrated and dependent upon utilizing these types of satellite and ground-based monitoring systems. And the human minds, and then moving the, the, the interaction of the mind with the universe away from a biological uh, mediated interaction mm -hmm. and to an interaction that's mediated by these synthetic systems that are created by the mind and used by the mind. I think it's just a really useful case to illustrate the point that, that, that this is what gives mankind new power over the universe, right? This gives us the ability to begin to look at things like forecasting earthquakes. We can now forecast and foresee future events and take actions that we couldn't take otherwise. And you know, really change our relationship to the universe around us based upon taking actions, which are only possible by this type of, uh, this type of process I'm describing here. And I think it also really goes uh, to the point that, again, Lynn, you've been emphasizing with the significance then of the landing on Mars with curiosity, is this is a further demonstration of this type of capability where uh, it's not just putting some object out there, but it's demonstrating that if mankind is going to continue to exist in the solar system and deal with these types of threats, which we've discussed through and through, I mean, these are serious concerns. You, one large comet and the human species could be gone like that. 
Mm -hmm. We might have a year's warning time at the most at this point, right? But the, the point is that the ability of mankind to ensure that that doesn't happen and to change the way we can act depends upon this type of process where the, where the human mind identifies with this type of uh, creation of synthetic systems that expand the power of the human mind to act and uh, observe the universe you know, in the solar system. And the curiosity is a, is a clear demonstration of where we need to go absolutely. And then, you know, so just to, to bring it back, this, this conference was very significant because it gave a clear perspective, a clear direction in where we could go uh, if we can get the type of shift in the United States away from a completely suicidal path and towards collaboration and developing these capabilities and ensuring and guaranteeing the defense of mankind. Um, so that's kind of what I just want to open with. I think, Leona, you want to add a couple of things. I think this is actually the most crucial part of the strategic defense of Earth proposal mm -hmm. because you know there has there has been discussion around for for quite a while now for a couple of decades now uh, sparsely mostly around defending from asteroids defending from space debris and so on but in the context of now in the context now of the whole war situation building up now you see the in, in increase over just the past weekend and so on that this is a real strategic flank to say look the the way that we're going to stop this whole build up this empire uh, train build up is the same is the same route that we're uh, that we should have gone in the whole for, in the first place which is uh, is really a question of scientific method Mm -hmm. That those two are fully integrated, the in integ the the advancement of our scientific method and the uh, the uh, aversion of war, mm -hmm. of empire style war. I think that's the that actually has been the most important thing to communicate over the past several weeks, especially in our work in Congress and so on. It ca this cannot this can't be treated as the point we've been making is this cannot be treated as a hobby, as something nice to do. Wouldn't it be nice to have a space program to deflect asteroids at some point? But that it is a real strategic flank right now to, uh, to address the whole cause of why we're in this situation in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so I want to look at the, the sort of the phase that we're in right now and the uh, ability for us to be where we're at even now, which is, um, you know, what we're dealing with right now as far as the capability to do this, which is for forecasting, earthquake forecasting, weather forecasting, and so on, has been actually a pretty short history. I mean, the first satellites that went up, Sputnik 1, that's it, that was in 57. You know, people were, when you were alive then, and... <laughs> And a lot Crazy. of people were <laughs> uh, remembered that time. Mm -hmm. They heard the beeps. You know, uh, you can get it from a ham radio, and so on. This is, this is the, the that was the first satellite. It had no instruments. It was basically what it gave us. It, the only instrument it really had was a radio transmitter. Mm -hmm. So it gave us yes, the first measurements of the ionosphere, uh, and then also the density of the atmosphere, just from its drag. A ba very, very basic. The second thing that went up was Sputnik 2 with a, a dog. Yeah. Right? The third thing that went up was our, our explorer. And mm -hmm. as soon as we put something up with scientific instruments, what did we find? We found something that was forecasted, which was not only cosmic rays, cosmic activity, but parts where... Actually, this is actually a very interesting story. I took measurements and they didn't have a tape recorder on hand that, that, that was on the machine or on the satellite. So uh, it would take measurements, and then it would black out. Hmm. And then it would take more measurements, and then it would black out at times. And they thought it was, it could be, it, were these points where there was no cosmic activity? Was there, uh, was it point, were there points where most likely they were just, uh, lapses in communication. Later on, they find out with Explorer 3 that 
uh, actually, it, they were just being, they were running into zones which were super saturating the measurement devices. Mm. So it wasn't that they were zero, but that they were, there were point, there were areas which were uh, too extreme for the measurement devices to actually take up. Mm. And these were, this was of course the, our first measurement of the inner belt of the radiation belt. Mm -hmm. This is the first thing that we put up, and what did we find was this incredible structure outside of our, uh, right, not even outside, it's actually part of the Earth, and in incredibly integrated with, now we know, our weather, the ionosphere, earthquakes, mm -hmm. uh, Earth, so-called so terrestrial activity. And now what we see is, you know, it's, it's incredible because that was one of our first discoveries, and now we've launched this new uh, radiation probe, uh, radiation belt space probes. Right. And you see how the picture is filling out. We've mm -hmm. and we've launched several three th thousands, depends on which source you're looking at, but really thousands of satellites. Um, just a few thousand who went to our operation now, but such to the point where we filled out this picture. And now with the ra new radiation probes, you're looking at what type of uh, cos or ions we're, we're talking about, what mm -hmm. type of subatomic particles you're talking about, what is the intricate re interrelation with solar activity, mm -hmm. with, uh, when you're talking about magnetic or electric activity, how is this integrated to uh, how the Earth, how supposedly terrestrial properties res respond, right. and so on. So you're, this is, it's not just what you're, what, what we see with uh, our increasing array is not just more eyes out there, more mm -hmm. types of eyes out there, but it, and it's, it's not just filling space in the extension standpoint, mm. but you're talking about filling space in the sense of being able to conquer more actual principles or being able to conquer more interactions. And this is, this is I think, the, um, what's so unique about the multi-parameter forecasting method, which is that you're, you're not really looking at these separate things. It's not really, you're not really looking at gravitational and then magnetic and then ionospheric and then, you're not looking at these things as, as just several senses. What you're trying to, trying to get a picture of is the, the, the strategic picture, the full integrated uh, top-down interaction of all the principles, so, such that then you're just acting in that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is, I think, now you're, you're dealing with, I mean, now you're dealing with how the mind operates in not just earthquake forecasting, but as you pointed out in the paper that is coming out very soon mm. on metaphor, it's, it's the same principle that is not only earthquake, earthquake forecasting, economic forecasting, but it is it's classical composition. It's all the same forecasting principle. Yeah. Yes, that's, <clears throat> that's what I will be finishing up it, because the final stages, I'm very careful because this is a precision statement. Mm -hmm. It's not a description, it's a precision statement. Mm -hmm. Uh, the point is that the ability of the human mind, as we know it, to uh, forecast the future is located only in classical musical composition. It's the only place we have a clear view of that. Uh, this we became really clear first with the work of Bach and his uh, Preludes and Fugues as a set, the two sets of these things, were the first demonstration. And now what happened, this went into music generally in the in the 18th century and into the 19th century, the beginning of the 19th century. It was the actual classical form of music as opposed to the romantic. Mm -hmm. The romantic form, as by Liszt and so forth, was actually junk because it introduced factors which were not uh, comprehensible. Mm -hmm. That is, they had no rationality to them. They were simply effects. And uh, this goes back a century, and our knowledge of this area goes back to Cusa in that century. And that's where you first get this kind of reporting. It, it, it existed earlier. There are references to it all over the place. And, but in cl what we call classical musical composition, 
which is very limited, does not include uh, Franz Liszt, it does not include the junk file people later. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it, 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 most of our young people today have absolutely no competence whatsoever in terms of principles on which their very existence depends. Mm. So-called popular music is actually the destructive destruction of the mind mm -hmm. because it, it, it causes you to give up access to means which are readily available to mankind, which, which have to have a, cu a cumulative effect. The, the human mind cannot master this thing all by itself. It, it's mastered by the history of the evolution of classical musical composition and by different kinds of instrumentation and performances. And so what's happened is, is with the introduction of the so-called romantic school, mm. which began to take over after the eight, uh, 19, or 1812, the period, um, 1812, 1815, uh, we had a, a decline in the ability of people to think. Then you have another point, which gets into the uh, pre-World War I uh, period. And you have there another a very brief period of fundamental discoveries, which all are based on this idea of these harmonics. Mm -hmm. Because the, the, what I do, what I, my specialty, is, is forecasting. And forecasting depends upon the ability to understand, for example, for, to modern people, um, to understand Bach. If you understand even the Bach preludes and fugues, you have an insight into it because in Bach, this, these compositions in particular, huh? you actually have, you have a statement which is in the present, the opening statement. Then you go and you develop it, and you, it reverses the relationship. And so you have a different sense of time as a result of this. And it's only in classical musical composition, which we can get traces of back into the earlier centuries, but it's especially the classical uh, development of the uh, 19th, 19th, 18th century and 19th century. That development is the one source that we have a clear understanding or ability to understand exactly how this thing works, how we can forecast. I'd like to read a, just a quote from the paper itself yeah. that you wrote. It says, J.S. Bach's method, as typified by his work in the two sets of preludes and fugues, has the hearable implications of a system reflecting the evolutionary emergence of the future. And that's a that's a really good um, way to state it. And then later on, you say, uh, in the same light, competent insight into crucial developments occurring in the future depends upon the development developed capability of the forecaster to have predetermined the content of the action by means of which the foreknowledge of the future changes the present course of events. And it, it's just a very good, um, I think it's a very good example of uh, this classical way of thinking yeah. and an ability to actually be able to see the future in the now. It, mankind has obviously always had this capability, mm -hmm. you know, for all, for all intents and purposes. But we, we, with the brutish cultures, when, because where people are brutalized, in, in, like the peasantries are generally brutalized, uh, the oligarchical system brutalizes the population, they become stupefied. They really can't think anymore. They're not competent. They're confused. They have no certainty, a sense of certainty of something they know experimentally, they can test and prove. Um, and this power lives essentially in, in various forms, but the most common one is classical musical, musical composition. And the, what, the significance of Bach, particularly the preludes and fugues, the two sets, is one of the best exercises. And you can, when you hear somebody uh, performing a Bach, some of these Bach elements, you can hear the stupidity in the performers. Because they, they don't have, in this process, what you do, you actually have a reversal, a sense of a reversal of the process. And that's what, that's what the development process is. Mm -hmm. So you make a statement, then you make a counter statement, and then you resolve it. And you find that the, there are lawful relations which come up in composition as a result of this process. And this process, which has been developed, you know, we know it best since about the uh, 
well, say the 16th century. Uh, the, what we know of this it has been the one way in which we can forecast the future. Mm -hmm. we, we, you're not forecasting the future as an event, though you can come, time, come to that. But in classical musical composition, especially since Bach and up through Furtwängler and so forth, you have a very clear understanding of how the future is determined as knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. It's not, not, not in the sense you would like to have it knowledgeable, but it's the way it is knowledgeable. And you, you can hear in a great performer of music, as I've had the privilege of knowing some, uh, and knowing their work and knowing how they work, that in the, the great uh, performers of classical musical composition have an instinctive capability which is based on the whole idea of development, the principle of development in classical musical composition. There is a, there is a sense of the future. And this has also a moral effect, hmm. is the person who has, has this kind of experience and is aware of it has a moral capability which other people do not have. And what's happened now is we had, since the introduction of people like Franz Liszt and so forth with wild men of that type, uh, having orgasms rather than, than uh, ideas, uh, okay. that we've lost that. And we have a population today which is much more stupid in this century now, this new century, than it was in the previous century. And you, then you look at things like you know, the development of physical science in the 1890s and immediately following before the 1920s. And you find there's a degeneration in the ability, uh, capability of scientific thinking among the population. What, you, what we got from Einstein, for example. Einstein is just an example of these several people of great creative minds coming out of the 19th, developments of the 19th century in particular, which did this. And you had it earlier in the musical development. You have it the same way. So it, the, it's our lack of uh, opening of our minds to these kinds of things. And it, instead of doing as most fools do, and I, they are fools, is instead of assuming that classical musical composition is some kind of old thing mm -hmm. or something of that nature, this is actually a capability on which the progress of mankind coming out of the dark ages brought forth this kind of understanding. The elements of it, of course, that existed as far as ancient Greece, you get, you get ancient Greek culture, has elements of this thing which are very clearly defined as such elements. You have the, in, the, in classical poetry, truly classical poetry, going way back, you get the same thing. And you get, this, you get the orgiastic uh, cultures, which are degenerate. And the contest has always been this, the, the, the struggle between this man understanding himself in the universe, man shaping, willfully shaping the way that a society functions, the way that, you know, and that's that's what we have, we, that's what we lost. We have lost that, we have a stupid generation now, stupid population, and our problem is we've got to rescue people from this kind of stupidity. Yeah, we saw that, this, it, we've been seeing this over and over again, this type of, this, what, it's moral degeneration, it's de, if it, which is closely related to de demoralization. But they, these, it's, it's reflected in the, right now, the uh, inability to act on this whole war threat because people are trying to move based on uh, what's previously occurred. Mm -hmm. Now, thermonuclear war has never occurred before. <laughs> so statistically, that means it's never going to happen. Yeah. But <laughs> it's because if it ever happened, we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. And so, but that really, it, it's, it's, it's rampant in the way that people think is this this uh, it's a deductive way of thinking, rather than what you're laying out, which is the, this classical way of thinking. Yeah, which is in Bach in particular, mm -hmm. that you you make a, an opening statement that is not your composition, that's the setup, mm -hmm. and now you go into the the ironical development of the, this process. Now that you go from the conclusion of the composition, now it becomes back and becomes the leading element of the composition so that the order of space and time is, is different. Mm -hmm. And this is what, what I've depended upon in all my forecasting. It depends upon exactly that principle. It's the same principle that is true of Bach's, uh, Reynolds and Fugues in particular. 
is what's true of all, all, all classical music of any, of any competence whatsoever. It always has the same. You, you go through the experience, and when you reach the end, you go back, you realize you have to go back to the beginning to understand what the meaning of the beginning was. Hmm. And, and that's the process. Hmm. And I've, all my forecasting that it, it does is based on this, not just music, but it's based on this. And that does work. You can forecast the future. Man can and must forecast the future. If mankind does not develop the power to forecast the future, mankind is doomed, as the case now. Like all these idiots who are supporting Obama, say it's bad, but it's not that bad. In other words, here we are, you have the former president of the United States, Bill Clinton, has attached himself with great regret to Obama. I, my view is that uh, Clinton actually despises and hates Obama. Uh, but uh, he adapts to things that way and accepts to some degree, at least by his actions, accepts what is happening. We are now headed for the extermination of the human species because what we're on the threshold of now is a thermonuclear war. All the elements are there. The triggers are all there. And if someone gets to a certain point and sets off the Middle East, like this Arab operation, mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. if they set that thing in motion, this will go, with, if Obama is president, this will go to thermonuclear war. It can happen this year, still this year, or the beginning of next year. That's where we are. And it's more likely to the begin this year than next year mm -hmm. at this time. So therefore, we are in, in peril precisely because we are stupid. And our stupidity consists in the fact that we don't understand that it is possible to forecast the future, not to predict an event, mm -hmm. but to forecast the condition of, in the future and to estimate the time frame in which that, that development will occur. It doesn't mean it can't be changed, but it's precisely the point. You can change it if you can forecast it. If you can forecast what's going to happen, you can intervene to change it. Mm -hmm. And that's been the, the characteristic of all great discoveries of principle in science and so forth and in, and in culture otherwise, as in music. Mm -hmm. You're able to see the future not as an event, you know, plopping down before you, mm -hmm. but you see a change in the tension, the organization of, of society. And that's all my forecasting has been done, and I've been unique on this. I mean, all the major forecasting efforts in, on, since I, I started this thing in the middle of that. The 1950s. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That it's always been that way, and it always worked. The problem is most people, especially leading political circles, are incapable of competent forecasting of the future. Mm -hmm. First of all, because they don't know what forecasting is. They think it's what statistical predicting. Mm -hmm. They think that a statistical pattern and it never works that way. But actual competent forecasting is, is one instrument which we depend upon. And we're going to find that as we go into space, especially this Mars development, as we take on this question of, of dealing with these asteroids floating around out there, we're going to have to exactly use that approach of forecasting to deal right. with it. How are we going to deal with all these, you know, majority of all these asteroids out there mm -hmm. between Mars area and, and Earth area, all of this stuff is deadly and we don't know much about it. And you're not right. going to be able to predict it mechanically. Right. You're going to have to find a characteristic of the, of the space which g gives you a ability to forecast where this co collaboration uh, and, and what goes. Right. Huh? As you said, the forecasting is not, it's, about, it's a question of actually giving mankind an ability to act. It's about action, it's about creating action. A successful forecast is not predicting some event and letting that event occur. occur. It's, it's a successful forecast is actually creating the capability of mankind to create a new state, to create a new change. Is, is to forecast a phase space change. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what you can do. Which is, again, what you're warning about now is we're heading to a crisis point yep. where the way people have been accustomed to operate in a certain conditioning, certain framework of reference can't continue to exist. No. 
You look at the hyperinflationary collapse, the complete disintegration of the economic system, the acceleration of that collapse, and the strategic tension. And the way people have conditioned themselves to operate is in a, an environment that's about to completely transform around them. Take the case of Obama right now. Mm -hmm. Obama's complaining that he's, you know, have about a trillion dollars of debt in, in the deficit in the operation. Mm -hmm. And I could wipe that out, debt out immediately. All he has to do is let me do what I would do. Mm -hmm. huh? and, what, you, yeah. and what, what was, would that be? Right. Glass-Steagall. The introduction of Glass-Steagall and a, and a new collection of credit system mm -hmm. combined would an, eliminate entirely that $1 trillion problem. Right. All, all right, because the uh, debt lies in times in the imaginary income. The not existing, but imaginary <laughs> income. The Wall Street income. Wall Street would be actually go bankrupt. But that would not be an injury to the people of the United States. That would be the greatest blessing you could give them right now. Right. Because you, you, we don't owe that. Right. I mean, that was your campaign in 2008, before the bailout was launched. Yeah, yeah well, that was what I was trying to fight against, to prevent right. it from happening. Right. That's when I had an argument with Bill Clinton on this one. Mm -hmm. he, he, first of all, he, he made the foolish error of actually canceling Glass-Steagall. He was the guy that signed on to it when he right. was as president. Then in 2008, after my quarrels with him on this thing during that period, mm -hmm. he defended himself on going for this hyperinflation. And I said, you must not do that. Mm -hmm. And he was said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And look where we are. Right. Now, he was not the guilty for all the mess that happened, but his, his role in this situation indicates where he fell in the game he was playing. Mm -hmm. He was wrong in, in the first place. He was wrong in canceling the class steagle and signing on to it, whatever the pressure was, whatever the excuse was, is wrong. Mm -hmm. It was a flat wrong and it led to all this catastrophe. Right. It all began with that, that measure. Yeah. Then he knew it was wrong because he's the one who came out in the late 90s calling for a new financial architecture. Oh, that's what, he got clobbered for that. And he got clobbered for that. So he had a rec he demonstrated a recognition of what you've been saying, what the real rot in the whole system is. Well, he's a very bright fellow, and but he, if he, and that's when they came down with the whole Monica thing and all this garbage. That was all, that was all the impeachment garbage. Well, see, this, this came out, I, I was involved in that with him also in August of that year. But it, it came because of the uh, crazy Russian uh, game that they were mm -hmm. playing with their finances there and led to this you know, collapse of the income, uh, financial mm -hmm. system of Russia. And that was August. He got on to it and recognized that I was right and said so. And this was in August, going into September. Mm -hmm. Then he got hit with the Lewinsky thing, mm -hmm. and everything went wild. Right. So, but the point was, he's, he was, he's a bright guy. He's more intelligent than you, you would think he is, because there's some things he doesn't talk about, which he should talk about, which he should explore. Mm -hmm. But the problem right now is that he's playing with this thing, because his, he is not a man of action of the type of action I would play. But he, when he was in that situation, back in August of that year, there he recognized I was right and the other guys were wrong. At that point, he supported, supported my, my policy. But then he got clobbered for supporting my policy mm -hmm. because he made the foolish mistake of the Lewinsky thing. And they used the Lewinsky thing to destroy him, or virtually destroy him. He shouldn't have done it. He shouldn't have done it, period. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that's what he did, and he therefore he was crippled, and he never really got back again. He was weakened. He was trying to survive politically, mm -hmm. and he's not really a fighter, in a real sense. He's a, an intelligent guy. He, he knows a lot more than he will admit, ever admit. He's more smarter than he would ever admit because he won't show some kinds of intelligence, because he doesn't think it's advantageous to to show that. But that's the point. It, the, the, ability, the ability to forecast is something I can attest to. Mm -hmm. Mankind has that ability. And if you look at the history of composition, of classical musical composition, you can see exactly why it is in classical musical composition, especially in the 18th century, 19th century, that that is the model 
of creativity. And that's why it's important. Mm -hmm. If people don't have this quality of classical musical composition accessible to them, their minds aren't going to work capably for forecasting. And you, you see this very clearly in the work of Kepler. Actually, we're, we're going to be doing some more work and getting some of this revived and presented again. But Kepler represent, had a very, very clear expression of this integration of music, science, all from the standpoint of metaphor, the standpoint exactly. of mind. The principle of metaphor. Right. And it was uh, his, the crucial discovery he made mm -hmm. in defining metaphor. Uh, right. That, that's what really defined modern science. Mm -hmm. What? It is vicarious hypothesis yeah. in new astronomy. Yeah, that. completely broke mankind free from this, you know, hundreds that, of years of locked into this crazy sense perceptual system. And that came from that came essentially from Cusa, Nicholas Cusa. Right, and it was and he's explicit. Yeah, well, Cusa's uh, knowledge mm -hmm. was then he had the experimental approach, which as a brilliant solution by Kepler. Mm -hmm. So actually, when Kepler's discovery, which is actually a continuation of Cusa's work, mm -hmm. was was the foundation of all competent modern physical science, right? Because once you say we do not know, we cannot accept sense perception as the evidence of truth. It's a phenomenon, but it's not truthful, and therefore you have to understand what con preconditions are required. And if you don't understand the principle of metaphor, and by the way, the problem today is that even in the dictionaries and so forth, the definition of metaphor that circulated, especially during the course of the 20th century and beyond, is stupid. The, I, the, word, the way the word use, metaphor is used is actually stupid, scientifically stupid, and it's destructively so. And it's only through this understanding which you, you experience explicitly and with Bach and Bach on through as a really important leaders in this thing. Mm -hmm. That aspect of music actually contains the germ of what all competent physical science must be based on. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you can't forecast, right. not competently. Yeah, I think it's this, it, what you mentioned earlier about this being able to live in a new phase space. You, you're able to, in, in classical music, you're able to define a totally new phase space in which you then act in. And then you, you know, there's this uh, pretty simple example of you play a, a real classical piece to almost the end and stop it. People, yep, yep. right? <laughs> Wait, where is it? Where's the end? <laughs> right. So why is it that you know one that it hasn't ended, and then two, what it should be, even if you've never heard it before? Mm -hmm. right? That's that's one of the simple examples, but it also just reminds me of the way that. Uh, you know, the the way that Congress and people who make policy think, because right now, the way that when we present this whole solution, like, look, we have the solution. This is what you have to do. They say this is impossible, or how is this going to work? Right? These are the the, the vote yeah. very. Mm -hmm. This comes out almost every person asks this, or you know, how much is this going to cost? But it's always in the context of the previous phase space, the one that's driving towards destruction. So you're living in this and asking how is this new, how is something that is a reflection of the new phase space going to play out in the old one? Yeah. <laughs> Whereas the, the reason we're, what we're trying to communicate is no, we already live in the one that we're trying to create, which is the new phase space. We live in that and that's the policy we're bringing you now. In the way, if you want to have a scientist, you have to study Bach mm -hmm. and understand him. It would not be would not what's often done to him. They just play it up as if it were mechanical. The tension of, of the anticipation, which won't let you go, and that is the requirement of performing Bach as, and of all of his great followers, mm -hmm. is a te the tension that won't let you go until you have solved the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what forecasting is. Mm -hmm. That's what competent economic forecasting is. It's the same thing. But if you, if you have people who don't have a classical outlook in, in art and composition, if they have popular music rather than classical, they're going to be stupid mm -hmm. because they won't have the ability to, to see the future. Um, they're just running their head up against a blank wall. Mm -hmm. And Bruce has good headaches, but not much else.
That's where the fun is. Right. Mm -hmm. And the shift you're talking about at the beginning of the 20th century, when you look at Einstein's references to Kepler, you look at Einstein's connections to classical music, you know, it's very clear that that was the tail end of a, of a, a very clear continuity in thought that existed that we've really lost for the last century in terms of this full conception of what creativity is as such, you know, some connection to that. You have a lot of people that today that can perform tasks yeah. within a framework that's defined, and so they can do a lot of innovation, but we've, there's, there's been a dramatic loss of that fundamental connection to what you're discussing here. Yeah. You know, and it goes to a lot of what we discussed with the intervention intervention of Bertrand Russell and his reductionists and really cutting that off. Oh, yeah. But it's a core current of a connection to the you know, the, the uni unification of music and science under this conception of metaphor and what the natural state of the human mind is. Yeah. Bertrand Russell did more damage to science than any other single living person. Hmm. And therefore to mankind as a whole. And to mankind it was intention. Mm -hmm. He said, if we could kill, kill off the population with this deadly disease right. once in every uh, generation, mm -hmm. we could ha people could have as much sex as they wanted free <laughs> without making the world too crowded with people. <coughs> that was him, and right. he, explicitly. Mm -hmm. He was one of the most, he was the most evil man of modern history. Right. Mm -hmm. And people don't get that that is empire. Mm -hmm. That's what empire, that, that gets to the heart of empire. That's the extreme expression of oligarchism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we're faced with now. Right. And it goes to this question of music. You talk about popular music. What was the Congress for Cultural Freedom? Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, explicitly pushing... Right. Mm. Explicitly pushing an attack on this classical music. Explicitly pushing this crazy popular music, short, short uh, songs, two or three minute you know, hit songs and all this stuff. But from the standpoint of intentionally reducing the capability of the population to think. And you see it, and you see what, this, what the struggles have been from mm -hmm. that standpoint. Now you know what the, who the enemy is. Mm -hmm. That's the enemy. Well, let's that, hope we see the death rattle of that. <laughs> but, but quickly and gone. <laughs> let's hope want, that this is the death rattle here. It is. This is the death rattle. Yeah. Right. Obama is the death rattle of the United States. Mm -hmm. That's it. In fact, that's what he is. It's the natural expression of that type of system playing itself out right. against reality. This is the Emperor Nero, and that's what I, when I, you know, when they defined that in 2008, mm -hmm. that he was the Emperor Nero. He is an exact copy of the Emperor Nero. And he has acted, as I have forecast, as a copy of the Emperor Nero. That's exactly what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And if he fails, he'll kill himself as the Emperor Nero did, because he could not live in a universe in which he was going defeated. He would kill himself. First he sodomized his mother and then killed her. That's the way he went out. It was not really a very good man. No. <laughs> and that's what Obama's like. And that's what Bill Clinton and others have to realize. Mm -hmm. There is no future with Obama. There is no future United States if Obama remains president, even if he remains in the presidency in the weeks ahead. The danger is there. And that's the situation we're in. And you have this people who are innocently, in a sense, stu stupidly, you know, their, their own stupidity, which they adopt as a philosophy, blocks them from seeing reality. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they don't see a danger. They say, well, that's speculative. Yet we know it's going to happen. You know? It's like an earthquake. You can know it's going to happen. And if you know it's going to happen, maybe you can do something about it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't actually know what's going to happen, how can you do anything? How can you, how, how can you save yourself? And that's our problem. So that's why forecasting is necessary. You have to have, we have to develop people and educate young people to be able to understand what forecasting is. And the best way, of one, one of the best ways proven is you have it since the beginning of the Fincosa's period and up through 
the classical musical composition, which actually you see in the case of Furtwängler. Furtwängler does represent an authentic expression of this. It's precise. I mean, I've gone through this thing again and again. You know, ever since I first really understood Furtwängler when I was in Burma, coming out of Burma, going back to India, and it was that time where I was in a camp, a military camp, in India, before I went to other other destinations under World War II, and that since that time I recognized it, it was on a basis of a Tchaikovsky recording. It was done by B, uh, NBC, uh, British system, and they did a, a, a Tchaikovsky uh, symphony. And this thing, this shocked me d with delight. I was shocked with absolute delight when I when that thing ended. I was immensely satisfied. Mm -hmm. uh, and since that time, I recognized what Furtwängler was. After, you know, I just follow this thing, or oh, this guy, or oh, this guy. This is great. This is what I want, uh, and it's uh, that's the kind of performance of great works I want. Mm -hmm. and that's that's the way it's like in this. Now we we find we try to seek out great works, intellect, great intellectual works, which have a, an insight into the future. So you're not stumbling around in the dark. You actually have an intimation through the misty mists of the future, of what the future is, and you have a net, and then you know what you have to do. Mm -hmm. mm. You may worry a lot, but you have to do. You know what you have to do. And the Fertwängler we go is a, a, a really a, an excellent example of this, in some of his compositions in particular. Excellent, unique, mm. Mm. and much persecuted. But that's where we are. That's what what the world needs is mm -hmm. to realize what real classical culture was in Europe, and to spread it into the future. Mm -hmm. Then people will be able to defend themselves against stupidity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what makes me happy. I think it's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Should be prepared for a very intense week, I think. Yes, I've got to get. The, I'll get this thing done the next day or two. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, the finishing touches are very important to me, so I shall not make any mistakes. Okay. All right. Well, that will wrap it up for this week. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>